Welcome to Listening to Paint Dry with Mike and Dan, a podcast about the art and hobby of miniature painting. I'm Mike, and thank you so much for joining us on our continued quest to become better, braver, happier painters. This week, Dan and I are excited to bring you another fantastic interview with a neighbor to the north of Canada. We had the opportunity to have a chat with Chris Bello of Way of the Brush. He is a fantastic painter, and you can find him on YouTube. And of course, he has a Patreon, as well as his wayofthebrush.com. So without further ado, Chris Bello from Way of the Brush. So welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's always exciting to me. Um, I've actually been kind of uh, followed your work for quite a while. Uh, so it's always exciting to ha- be able to talk to somebody that I've learned so much from. So um, before the podcast, I kind of said thank you to you, but I also want to hear our li- have our listeners hear me say thank you to you for all the work that you've done for the community and added to it. Well, you know, thank you. Uh, I, I love looking at your your quick tips, your, uh, I, I was looking at, uh, I just painted Sigvald. And so I uh, spent some time watching you paint Sigvald as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a fun one. That was a, that was a fun uh, process. What a great model, actually. I was very surprised at how much I was going to enjoy painting that. Because I usually, that's not very close to what I normally paint. So Yeah, um, that, that model is a bit intimidating uh, looking at it. Because, you know, obviously there's so many great artists out there who uh, who produced like uh, non-metallic metal effects. And, you know, doing really going to town on that model. But as a modeler, uh, I found that it was real easy to do it in a sub-assembly. And it was like, it was made for you know, people to just slap together and slap them on the tabletop or do them in sub-assembly so that they can get into all the little nooks and crannies. And they made that part pretty easy for everybody, for all the painters out there, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, that definitely. It was, yeah, I definitely sub-assembled the heck out of it <laughs> yeah, yeah. for the same thing. Cause I can't remember the last time I gained, but uh, speaking of which let's, uh, could you mind if you tell our listeners a little bit about your kind of hobby origin stories, how you got into the hobby, um, this thing that we all love. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I mean, I started from a very young age. Uh, I've always had a very uh, artistic bend, as it were, uh, inspired by both my my parents, both my parents, um, well, my mother especially, uh, very artistic, although my father uh, was a programmer, and so math is very uh, important to him. Uh, my mother, you know, obviously is uh, photography and drawing, and uh, when I was young, she, she created a drawing for me, and, you know, uh, it was very important to me. And so I always, you know, was very leaning towards a lot of this, you know, expression and stuff like that. And it wasn't until about, well, it was in the, you know, the mid eighties, um, uh, around, you know, 86, 87 kind of thing. I was very inspired by movies, you know, uh, Aliens, Predator, Robocop, all these, you know, classic action films that I know I should, probably shouldn't have been watching when I was at that age, but I was watching them anyway. And um, I was into scale models you know, starships, I was into Star Trek. And so I was doing the starships and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I was also, you know, assembling cars and, you know, uh, World War II airplanes and even modern aircraft. And uh, I used to have a uh, SR-71 that, uh, you know, I lovingly assembled and, you know, all these different aspects. And uh, it was around 88, I had uh, moved up to uh, Quebec. I lived in Montreal and I had family there. And um, my, I was already into all this kind of stuff and, you know, I, I, you know, had toys, action figures and GI Joe, Star Wars and all that stuff. And, uh, my cousins, um, were a bit older than me. They were teenagers, uh, and they were playing, um, Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader. And I had seen, they had their table set up and they had just a small little table set up. They had this little battlefield set up. They had all the models all over the table. They had dice and like, it was all, it was all a mystery to me. And it was like, you know, and of course, you know, them being older cousins, you know, I immediately viewed them uh, obviously being really cool. And you know what I mean? I wanted to be like these guys because, you know, they're cool. And uh, you know, so after, you know, um, searching around and of course you know aliens being a big uh factor uh as far as being inspiration you know for you know whatever i'm fantasizing kind of thing about uh i came across space hulk and space hulk uh it, it, right from the cover art and i have a big print of the uh, piece um by the artist um jeffrey oh, 
why his name escapes me now. I, I apologize. But anyway, his piece uh, was, you know, what I loved about aliens, right? It's these Marines in corridors and these monsters coming up and, you know, and, and you know, it was very aliens inspired. And uh, I got into the game and then, you know, started reading the background for it. And then just, uh, just on another trip, I had discovered the uh, Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader uh, rule book. And, you know, there was a lot of air elements from Space Hulk that I recognized in this. And I said, oh, okay, so this is like the expanded stuff. And this is, you know, much larger universe. And, you know, and then just really kind of developed from there. And of course, I got the rule book and I had a mishmash of all sorts of models. I had Imperial Guard, Orcs, Chaos and Space Marines. And, you know, I was getting blister packs here and there. And of course, you know, um, even then, back then, uh, you know, $5 for a blister pack for five models, um, you know, it was it was a little bit pricey, but you know, it wasn't too bad, but yeah, uh, it, that's really the, about the origins of it is uh, I started off in scale modeling, discovered space Hulk fell in love with Warhammer 40,000 and it's been a uh, love hate relationship since uh, you know, 88 <laughs> essentially is about when I equate that, when I got into all of this. Nice. Now um, what made you decide uh, that you wanted to be a better painter of these two, you know, like that's, it's always a question that I, that I find interesting because sometimes it's competition. Sometimes it's just uh, an innate desire. So what made you decide that you wanted to take your painting to the next level? Um, I honestly, I don't see um, levels. I don't see, you know, plateaus as it were. I know we, we use those terminologies a lot uh, when we're talking about, you know, improving our, our skills as it were, but you know, when you are uh, a journeyman of sorts, you know, it is, there's, there's no real plateaus. Like if you're, you know, a plumber, there's no level one plumber, level two plumber, level three plumber. I mean, there's just varying degrees of experience. And as I developed as a painter, I mean, like I was always looking to emulate what I was seeing on the box art and what in the magazines. And of course, you know, my hobby uh, experience uh, was very GW centric, even though I did collect like uh, Ral Partha and TSR and, you know, all these other things in D and D I was in, got into that. It was really space Hulk was the gateway into a lot of these other things. And uh, as far as the painting was concerned, uh, yeah, it was just wanting to emulate what I was seeing in, in the magazines and stuff. I, there was no internet, obviously when I was getting into this hobby, and so my progress was very, very slow because I was picking up tidbits from magazines. And of course, uh, you know, it wasn't until I entered college that, you know, I started to, uh, when I went to college for art, um, that all these ideas I realized were trickled down from the, from the mainstream of art itself. And even the scale modeling stuff that I had known for many years and all these little other little things that would um, trickle down. Like, you know, I've, I've found over the years that a lot of these techniques that we use in miniature painting today all trickle down from the scale modeling world and, you know, the art world, of course. And so, uh, but yeah, I mean, as far as wanting to get better, it was just, I was inspired by obviously uh, painters like uh, Mike McVeigh, who was uh, famously made the uh, painting manuals uh, for Games Workshop. Right. That was a huge influence, uh, Blanche, of course, and, you know, all these other, you know, infamous um, Games Workshop um, names, household names, as it were. Um, you know, they were, they were instrumental into my growth. And of course, once the internet came about, um, or more, I guess in the late nineties is when I was, you know, really online and stuff like that. I, I really wasn't, you know, that inspired by a lot of other painters. Um, a lot of the, like the painting that I was seeing, especially from like France and, you know, in, uh, England and stuff like that, like the painting was way different than what I was seeing, especially in the game, uh, in the golden demons, um, what I was seeing in, on the North American side of things, North American side of things was very, you know, um, very different use of color and technique were very different at the same, you know, just separated by an ocean, you're seeing a world of difference, um, in the painting abilities, especially for like, you know, for France today, it seems like, you know, uh, a lot of it is from, um, you know, more of the Eastern Europe, uh, countries like Poland and such, where you're seeing these amazing artists, uh, you know, creating all sorts of stuff. And, but, um, 
yeah um it's it's really hard like i don't see it as levels um you know it's just gaining experience expanding your knowledge and just keep you know just keep painting and you you know what i mean because they're like to, to define it in in levels uh just doesn't make a lot of sense again you know a plumber there's not a level one plumber there's not a level two plumber you know and painting is the, is the same way i mean we're all on this journey and there's you know there's certain aspects that we're always kind of reaching for and we're always trying to master and i think the most important part is that we're always trying to master and we're always trying to improve and it's always little baby steps it's not just um you know one thing all of a sudden it goes oh you know and it opens a whole new door sometimes it is like that especially for those i guess that might not um be very artistic or have an art art background they kind of discover those things but unfortunately for me i i can't relate to that because um you know my journey was completely different and really that's the fun part about art and this this uh, miniature painting field is that you know um many of the people um around the similar age as myself you know their journey was pretty much the same thing versus somebody who's become a painter now who've only ever known the internet you know uh, i see people's skills develop very very quickly because you know the wealth of knowledge out there was versus everybody around my age gap you know the progression was you know fairly slow right and those techniques that are now blending from the art world and scale model world were much slower to happen when you didn't have the internet yeah absolutely i'm so yeah. I'm, right, I'm right i'm right there with you um was there um a technique uh that you found most challenging or a technique in general about miniature painting or maybe a technique that from uh kind of the art world translating it to the miniature painting world was difficult um difficult it was just you know really realistically i mean like right from the beginning it's kind of like coloring books staying within the lines so on a model you know and you're doing a space marines trim of his shoulder pad you know keeping the paint within those little borders you know that's one of those first hurdles that a lot of you know aspiring painters will uh, you know find challenging right staying within the lines as it were and a particular technique i mean i started off dry brushing because that's really kind of you know the first technique that you know outside of just simply dunking your brush in and slapping it onto the model you know that's really one of those first techniques that go oh okay i get kind of get it and it's you know it, it is often equated to being a noob technique but that's not true because there's also a great degree of mastery involved with dry brushing as well and doing dry brushing well is a challenge and you know then of course you get into glazing and glazing you know it wasn't that it was very hard to get into um because essentially glazing is just layering mm -hmm. it's just you're just changing the uh thickness of the paint so you know but otherwise the technique is the same as layering it's just you know you're working in thin thin layers and of course you're laying more and more layers down mm -hmm. yes there's a great degree of mastery involved to doing it well but otherwise, the fundamental of it itself, breaking it down to its fundamentals is relatively easy and similar with uh, wet blending or wet on wet blending or two brush blending or, you know, however um, you want to call it. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, the, the, those are those are all different um, techniques, uh, but there's a slight bit of nuance. But, you know, even like glazing, um, glaze blending, I mean, it's not actually blending the paint and that's not we often equate glazing with blends but in fact it's layering because again you're laying paint on top of each other your eye blends those colors together right because of the transparency right that makes sense. versus an actual blend which is taking you know a red and a blue and it actually mixing those colors on that surface that is an actual blending of those colors mm -hmm. versus laying blue down and taking a very thin red and building up that transition your eye is blending that color the colors themselves were not actually blended um so again i it's you know difficult to master everything about painting is is difficult especially if you're not you know don't have that artistic bend and so i again I, it's, mm -hmm. it's the same kind of thing i don't really you know experience 
difficulty with a technique. Um, you know, there's many different concepts out there and there's many that I even haven't, um, you know, tried myself. Um, and again, you know, if, as long as you're openly willing to try new things, try different color ideas, try different brush techniques, stuff like that, you're on the right path. If you're always willing to try new things, you're on the right path to mastering you know, of course, to really master something, you just kind of laser focus in. You only work with a particular type of brush. You only work with a particular type of paint. You only, you know, work within a particular type of technique and color scheme. And, and then that's when you really kind of laser focus in on true mastery. But then, you know, those masters, well, you throw, okay, we'll do some wet blending. You, I mean, you've glazed that, you know, to perfection, but do wet on wet blending. Let me see you do that. And then you're going to see they're going to do it. And it's going to be just like anybody else who's first time doing something. They're not going to be that great at it. They have a leg up on somebody who's completely new because they know how to work with the paint. They know how to control their brush. And so their result is going to be different, but it's still, it's still going to be a struggle for them because they're, it's outside their comfort zone. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 It always feels like I feel like uh, every time I pick up a brush, I'm um, behind the learning curve sometimes. <laughs> sure. Uh, and, um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's 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 perfectly normal. And in this day and age, you know, we are so afraid to fail at something that, you know, that is a mental block for a lot of people because, you know, they want it to be perfect right the first time. And we have to allow ourselves to fail, that we have to, you know, to, to love our mistakes and, you know, just be, don't be afraid to fail at something because everybody fails. Everybody falls the first time. Very true. That, that is very true. You know, my, my favorite artist ever is, you know, Bob Ross, you know, happy accidents, right? <laughs> yeah, yep, definitely. 100%. And mm. I've, I've mentioned many times about Bob Ross and, and you see it a lot in this community uh, where the comment gets thrown around of, Oh, he's like the Bob Ross of miniature painting. He's the Bob Ross of this. He's the Bob right. Ross. Oh yeah. And when I was younger, I used to watch Bob Ross all the time. And as I got into college, uh, you know, learning more about art and, you know, um, becoming an artist and all these things that I actually started to take a downward view of Bob Ross's painting and his style of painting, because I found it was very commercial. It was kind of like when you go to big box stores, furniture stores, you know, they sell you that wall art. And that was the kind of stuff that Bob Ross was creating. And so I actually had a very negative kind of view of it, of Bob Ross's work. And it wasn't until I actually started really maturing as an artist that I realized that Bob Ross is a great artist, not because of the paintings he created. That wasn't the medium he worked in. The medium was the media, the television. Mm -hmm. That was, that is what makes Bob Ross a great artist. It wasn't, it wasn't the oil that he slung onto the canvas. It was the camera, the media itself was what made him a great artist yeah and I, I one of the things i've always viewed with him too is that he opened the world of painting to so many people that mm -hmm. never would have even thought about it you know what i mean so yeah there, there definitely was a commercial aspect of it um so i totally get that and it does have that that feeling he, he made know. it very accessible mm -hmm. and he and and to his credit he um dispels a lot of the fear that one who um you know when they're taking that first leap into painting you know he get he alleviates some of that anxiety about you know slapping some oil paint onto a canvas and yeah he just makes it look as easy as possible because it is it's it, it's not painting is not rocket science right and you know it's it's just slapping paint i mean you could easily paint a miniature with just your finger you could paint, a, you know, you can finger paint a miniature. You could totally do it. How well you're going to do it, I have no idea, but <laughs> but you could, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm un it's unfortunate for me. I'm si I, I'm six five, so I have really big clump. Most of my hand, my <laughs> fingers are as big as a mini, so it might just be a monochromatic scheme for me. <laughs> but um, if that's all you had, I'm sure in a year or two 
you could develop a technique where you know you would use various aspects of your fingers your mm-hmm. fingernails and other tools to get to an end result that looked pretty darn good that you were happy yeah. with you know well you know and i also think the biggest thing i i saw on the Evier metal facebook page uh they posted uh, a video of a guy who was paralyzed from the neck down but paints with his mouth and mm-hmm. uses a brush and i was and and the stuff that he was they showed would would probably be classified as a very high tabletop and he was painting eyes and i'm like damn it i got both hands and i can't paint eyes man (laughs) (laughs) yeah anything is certainly possible let's switch gears a little bit and talk about what made you decide to move into the world of, of teaching and making videos for miniature painting um well i mean like I've, I've always kind of been a teacher uh, in some aspects because as I was really into Warhammer 40,000 and all these other games, you know, and um, in my gaming group, uh, I had moved up to Northern Ontario in my teens and I was about 15. So it was about 1990 and I moved up into Northern Ontario and there wasn't an active community and so I got my friends into it. My friends convinced the store owner to start carrying product. And then the community just kind of took off from there. And uh, my friends who, you know, who would play D&D and stuff like that, you know, we had miniatures and, you know, a couple of my other friends who were, you know, um, had artistic uh, leanings as well, adopted this stuff right away and you know it was teaching others and it was teaching our gaming group and of course you know you kind of become known as the the group painter and i'm sure every community all over the world where there's active war gaming and miniature painting and stuff like that there's always one person in the group who is the teacher in the group and is inspiring others and is helping others and now how successful they're doing it who knows you know, I'm sure to varying degrees of success either way, but, um, you know, there's always at least one painter in that group and in the community in whatever town and city and, you know, whatever's right. And, uh, yeah, it was, it just kind of stemmed from that. And I've worked odd jobs and, you know, I went to college for art and, you know, I could just as easily have uh, gone to college for teaching as well, which was an option. So teaching people, um, has always kind of been in, in my, my bones as it was anyway. So, you know, I enjoy, you know, the communal aspect of it all. Uh, I like the idea of, you know, helping others. Uh, it's kind of what drives me today really is all about helping people and teaching. Um, you know, it is, uh, to, to my way of thinking, it's still a pretty noble kind of profession when done properly. Um, because there are improper ways of teaching, you know, especially if it's, you know, something lazy, like, you know, just turn to this module and do the workflow. And, you know, I don't care for that kind of thing. But when the teacher is passionate about the subject matter, that translates to the students and it makes them excited about the subject matter, whatever it is, physics, chemistry, you know, math, art, whatever. Right. And yeah, I try to bring some of that to you know the teaching experience uh i enjoy you know showing people how to do this and i enjoy really kind of lifting the veil on their apprehension their anxieties their fears about these kinds of things Uh, because you know i was once in that same kind of boat and i know that once that veil is lifted holy moly there's a whole world of opportunities and new ways to look at things when that um that fog is lifted and you know i kind of like to play a role in that uh for a lot of people and that's really the driving goal is to is to educate and to inform and to sometimes entertain i don't know i always view these interviews as gifts uh because i get to pick the mind of great artists and great teachers and so and get to meet new 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 people and it's uh well, that, that, that's a I'm, really great attitude to have because yeah. realistically, we should always view our interactions with other people, especially when we're somebody new. Um, and, you know, it is a gift 
to have these interactions with each other. And, you know, on, in light of our current situation of the world, hopefully, I would have hoped that this would not be lost on people because, yeah, human interaction is very important. And, you know, a lot of us are slowly coming to that realization that life is all about these interactions. You know, so, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I, I never thought, would have thought I would have missed the concept of a convention scene, yeah. uh, you know, being an introvert. So <laughs> same here. No, same here. I, I miss it. Like my favorite is Adepticon. I I'm I've gone to that last five years and yeah, I miss it this year. I didn't think like when I first announced, it, I was like, Oh, fooey. And, you know, I was thinking about the good times. And then I was like, you know, I kind of really miss it. It's, you know, mm -hmm. it's a shame. Oh yeah. Yeah. And this is my first, this will be my first year. I, I've only ever gone to the Nova open. Um, hmm. And so, cause I was planning on attending that this year. And then of course this whole thing happened, right? Oh yeah. yeah we're uh, whatchamacallit. Uh, I'm 20 minutes away from it. So uh, right. oh, yeah, geez, yeah. I have no excuse to get not to go, but uh, <laughs> um, plus anytime, you know, you can get a, get into sit in a class with Roman Laplatte teaching. I'm going to take every opportunity I can. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to throw a random curveball question at you okay. because I've asked this of other people um, that are Canadian as well, whether they're painters or friends of mine, et cetera forever night am i remembering that as a good tv show do you remember forever night no the there was a canadian it was a vampire cop it oh. was a canadian tv show and then it ended it was canceled in canada and then tbs bought it and ruined it <laughs> um <laughs> as, as it happens uh, right exactly you know and so i've gotten mixed responses from canadian friends like some one friend went yeah, before TVS, it was amazing. And then I have another friend who's like, that show was always crap. And so I just uh, picking a brain I, of a Canadian. <laughs> I, I never watched it. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I actually don't really watch a whole lot of TV. Mm -hmm. um, I'm usually kind of a late adopter, especially for a lot of TV shows. I'll, if it kind of strikes the interest, I'll catch it. If it, you know, and otherwise, and most of the time, I'm really kind of a hard sell on, you know, newer type of things. Because they're often, especially, you know, just being old um the, the rehashes of previous things and you know it's i don't know it is it is kind of a snobby type of attitude to take to you know think like oh well they can't do it better than the original well sometimes they can mm -hmm. usually they don't but sometimes the potential is there that you know they can really kind of you know really do something with it but no uh, unfortunately though, that show though no i'm not that familiar with it um i mean that's I really had to concentrate to, to <laughs> re even recall <laughs> that. Recall it. Yeah, it was from, I think it was the, the early 90s or something like that, for sure. Yeah. But I mean, speaking of original versus, you know, whether the new one is better on your shelf, I see Baby Yoda there. <laughs> I think that there might be an example of the new being better than the old, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, and the thing is, is that, yeah, like way back in the day, yeah, there was a whole bunch of Yoda. Uh, and when Empire Strikes came back, or Empire Strikes came back, Empire Strikes Back. Mm -hmm. right everything was yoda 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 and you know now with the mandalorian it's the baby yoda and you know it's it's carefully orchestrated how how that little guy came to be right and oh sure mm -hmm. so yeah you know i i yeah. will say if you haven't seen this and i am i am always skeptical when i go into superhero things but the first two seasons of the netflix daredevil say daredevil show were different than anything I'd ever seen as far as superheroes go. Even you, you could even say, you know, oh, Deadpool was rated R, but this was so different. And some of the, I like, I'm not a big fight scene person, but even I was going, holy crap, that's amazing choreography. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Daredevil was a really good series. Uh, I enjoyed uh, almost all of them other than Iron Fist. Mm -hmm. Um. But I thought, you know, Je even Jessica Jones was really good. And, you know, uh, Daredevil, I really enjoyed. And Punisher was good. And uh, Luke Cage was really good. But yeah. yeah, Iron Fist, I had a hard time. I just could not empathize with the main character. He mm -hmm. was just too whiny for me. And just, you know, he was just, I don't know. He just was not interesting at all. 
And that's that's a bummer to me too, because Luke Cage and Iron Fist combo comics were the first comics I ever. But that and Ghost Rider were the first comics I bought before I got into Spider Man. Yeah. And so that was I thought everything about the first season of Luke Cage was amazing until if you haven't watched Luke Cage, pl- plug your ears. <laughs> when they killed Cottonmouth, I went, "What the hell? He's one of the best bad guys I've seen on TV in ages." You know. Yeah. Like he's not quite as good as the Vincent D'Onofrio Kingpin, but he was up there. I mean, which is a role I never thought somebody would be. I, I never thought Vincent D'Onofrio as Kingpin would work, but holy crap, that worked, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now back to miniature painting. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of love these conversations because they don't have to go by any rules because you know what? It's my <laughs> it's my podcast, so I can do what I want. <laughs> So I want to ask you about something I noticed that is unique in your videos, and that is the glass palette. Um, Everywhere, if you turn on a video, it's homemade wet palette, they're using Redgrass Games, Mastersons, that's kind of the, the, the staple of them all. So what made you decide to go with the glass palette when uh, doing your videos, and do you use that palette when you paint normally? So uh, I do use it when I'm painting normally. Um just because like my filming area is my work area and you know all my painting just basically occurs on that space um as far as it you know like when i'm really going to get into some painting if i'm planning on you know doing some colors and some i'm going to really kind of get into some glazing i often will bust out my wet palette which is a homemade jobby only cost me four bucks i made a video on it a long time ago but anyway uh but as far as the glass palette thing is concerned that is entirely um, due to um, the nature of how I produce the videos. That is it. There is like, I get a lot of questions a lot of times, like why I'm using the glass palette. Is there benefits of using a glass palette over, you know, um, a piece of plastic? Uh, Cause like for palettes, as long as like for any new person out there is if you're busting out a palette, perfect. Great. That is already, that's one step already to being a more efficient painter rather than painting straight from the pot, which a lot of painters do. Um, using a palette is, is integral into getting better at being pa- a painter because it allows you to control the paint. And sometimes I'm, I am a bit of a control freak. Mm-hmm. And so uh, using a glass palette um, it just simply allows me to, um, you know, uh, basically, uh, it's easy to clean. It's easy to clean between shots and between, you know, videos and stuff like that. So th- that's the only reason. When I started making uh, uh, videos, uh, basically, once I started working for Mini Wargaming, it was um, it was uh, CD lids that we were using, and the clear side of CD lids, uh, the CD cases. Right. Uh, because uh, it was transparent, it didn't inter- it didn't offset the white balance because most palettes are white, and on video that throws off the white balance because under sense. the bright lights it throws the white balance off, and you know it makes uh, you got to constantly keep adjusting all the time. And so even when you move your hands within a shot, the white balance can change, especially if you leave it on auto. And if you if you switch it to manual. Well, you have to calibrate and you got to take a little bit of time and your shots have to be consistent. Otherwise, you have to relight the scene and redo your settings, uh, adjust your gains and stuff like that, right? It's a huge pain in the butt. Um, using the glass, because it was clear, whatever the tabletop surface was, would simply allow that. And um, with my big glass palette, it came, it came from a friend. Um, he, he, he infamously is Mini Wargaming Joe. Um, for any longtime viewers of Mini Wargaming, they're familiar with Joe. Uh, and uh, he always hooks me up with um, big pieces of glass because he's he's a glass cutter. Oh, wow. And he's working with this stuff all the time. So I've got a big, nice, big tempered sheet of glass. I don't even know what it's from, but it's heavy. I think it's probably from a tabletop, really. And um, all I do is I lay uh, whatever color I want underneath it because that way it looks interesting on the videos because like in in my current iteration of uh tutorials that i create fresh tips it is a blue background but when i first started creating fresh tips you can see it was the old cutting mat or you know right something else under the underneath the glass but i still use the glass because it's easy to clean between videos and 
yeah, that's really it. It's, it's, it's that simple. I mean, like, it's just a production thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Same thing with um, my lights. Uh, Whenever people would see my work uh, set up, they would see that I had uh, parchment paper over my lamps. And that, and there was like, well, why, why are you doing that? Uh, it, now, working under diffused light does help your eyes. It also, um, you know, alleviates shadows when you're painting, which is, um, you know, helpful because when you see shadows on a model surface, you can end up filling in the wrong space, right? Mm-hmm. Or under a diffused light, it is a lot more beneficial because you don't have those harsh lines that you're seeing. Um, but the main reason for the lamps having the diffusers on them was because of video production. So all the decisions that are often you'll see in my workflow, it's often because of video production and it's, it has really nothing to do with painting itself. Mm-hmm. Um, to go back a page, Bob Ross, whenever you saw him describing his palette or his tools and people would ask like why he has uh, duct tape and stuff like that on his tools, it was because of video production, because the lights, the harsh light, and it would, it would throw the white balance off on their screens. Mm. And that was it. That's the only reason. That's why all his tools had tape on them or, you know, looked a little junky or, you know, looked funny because yeah, it was, it was video production. That that was (laughs) it. It it wasn't had, it had nothing to do with his process. It was entirely video production related. And that's the same thing with the glass palette, the fuses on lights, stuff like that. And I thought it was going to be something like, Oh yes, because I can completely control the transparency of paints. And (laughs) (laughs) now, yeah, that, that is But I mean, working from like, um, um, I remember uh, in an old painting guide, I remember uh, they they described using a a bathroom tile, a white bathroom tile, right? Because it had that really glossy surface that made it really great for using it as a palette because you could easily clean it. But also because uh, it was that bright white, you could also see your colors and how you were, you know, mixing your colors or how thin you were getting your colors. Um, On that topic of palettes, I see a lot of people still, um, you know, using their fingers or the thumb or whatever, and they're testing their paint out on their fingers and they get a lot of paint on themselves. And I've I've never really understood that one because I've never done that myself. Coming from art, you know, using oil paints. I mean, I don't put oil paint on myself to see how my paint is reacting <laughs> or anything like that. And, you know, salt using solvent-based paints, you don't want to put that on your skin, right? Mm-hmm. But I mean, because we, most of us are using water-based non-toxic paints, it's okay to do that. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I, I've never really understood that. And when I was going through college, uh, I was taught, if you, if you don't know what your paint is doing on your palette, then you don't know what your paint is doing. Mm-hmm. So no matter where you test it, if you don't know what it's doing on that palette, on that work surface, because the palette is your workspace to get your color right before you apply it to your subject. Mm-hmm. And th- that's the way, and I've always operated under that. So like whenever I'm painting, I'm not covered in paint unless of course I'm airbrushing and then paints everywhere. But right. <laughs> yeah. But- I, I know from a hand painter perspective of me, uh, I typically do my fingernail for glazes uh, just to see the transparency of the paint. But like if I, a lot of times it's just taking paint off the brush, like, oh crap, I got too much on, you know, like, and like kind of that. I, I know there are, I've heard other people explain for different various reasons, but for me, I'm, I'm simple in that I will test out a transparency of a glaze on a thing on a fingernail and the rest of it's just taking paint off the brush. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean like testing out the transparency of the paint. I mean, yeah, it's not entirely necessary unless of course your finger is because like how, how the paint reacts on your flesh, on your bare flesh. And I see a lot of painters who do this on their bare flesh. Um, it is not the same as what the model surface is going to do. Because first of all, your, your flesh is very porous. There's also right. oils. Um, so it, it's not going to react the same way. And so it's not a good analog to, to test out your colors, to test out your glaze, to test out consistency, to test out viscosity. It is not a good analog for that. Mm-hmm. And so again, I don't understand. And the only thing I can equate it to is that there is a very well-known painter in Europe who I know from his tutorials, having watched them years and years and years and years ago, he did it. Could be. And th- that's the only reason, I, that's the only thing I can equate it to because nothing in my experience in, you know, 30 some years of doing this did, you know, 
that that was the only person I knew of that way back then who did that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I can only assume that that's because everybody else watched those videos and said, well, putting paint on myself is going to make me going to be the sign of being a good painter. <laughs> you know, that that's a falsehood. Uh, that's, you know, uh, same with, with the licking of the brushes. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can't talk about that. That's later. Oh. Right. Okay. <laughs> Am I jumping ahead? I'm jumping You're ahead. You're jumping ahead on something. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Well, that takes away one of the lightning round questions. All right. Um, <laughs> Oh, no my worries. Bad, my bad. That's okay. That's okay. Um, so in, in your, in the time in the hobby that you've had, uh, cause it sounds like your, your time frame was very similar to my time frame. Um, has there anything, a tool or something that's come out that you felt like kind of, uh, besides YouTube and such kind of re revolutionized miniature painting? Like for me, I always say bottled washes was a huge thing because we're coming in from the world of White Dwarf in the 80s when it said we used an ink wash and going, what the hell is an ink wash? Um, to all of a sudden mm -hmm. coming back in 25 years later going, oh, they sell those in bottles now. You know, like. <laughs> right. And and the things like and the things like the the bottled washes, well, they were emulating emulating what the scale modelers were doing anyway with oil paints and oil right. washes mm -hmm. because scale modelers have been doing it for ages. But as far as a tool, yeah, when I was turned on to uh, wet palettes, like, I don't even know how long, ago, well, since college, I guess. So 20 years ago, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's 20, 21 years ago, but anyway, um, yeah, wet palettes for acrylic paints. And mm -hmm. because, you know, um, most of us, a vast majority of us, uh, we're not unlimited resources to spend on paints whenever they dry up or, you know, we're burning through colors or anything like that. And so, you know, we're always, you know, mindful of, you know, our usage of the paint and the wet palette. Yeah. It allows you to go a little further with your color. So one little dollop of paint uh, goes, goes pretty far as opposed to throwing that little dollop of paint onto a, a regular palette. Um, you know, your paint goes a little further because, you know, obviously when you're using a dry palette, uh, the paint dries up pretty darn quickly as opposed to the wet palette where it preserves it and you go a little further with it. So yeah, a wet palette um, was like, was a game changer really for my painting because yeah, I could go a little further. I could explore, um, you know, the glaze a little further and my color mixture a little further. I could just go further and yeah, it, that was really the big one for me was a wet palette. And that was uh, since my college days. You know, it, it's, it's interesting to me, too, that um, that's another one of those areas of the, the art world that bled into the in, miniature painting world, because my daughter has a mentor who's in her 70s. Um, and she's talked about when she was in college that she had a wet palette. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> they're like, yeah, we just use, you know, whatever type of plastic container we had, we put some paper towels in it. And, you know, <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh, and, wow. <laughs> and, and, and unfortunately, you know, like for a lot of us or for some of us, I should say, I guess, cause it's probably not um, a big community, but a lot of us who have art backgrounds. Yeah. There's like very little surprises um, in miniature painting. And in fact, anybody who has been, you know, doing scale modeling, a lot of this stuff is old hat anyway, because, right. you know, like using the oil paints, oil washes using, you know, I mean, like for, for example, like one of the things that I've been using for um, my, my gloss varnishes, mm -hmm. uh, I picked up from scale modeling many right. years ago. Um, you know, I use pledge, uh, which is a floor uh, protector. Right. And that's a scale modelers thing. Um, so, you know, for anybody who, you know, I don't know, I don't know why anybody would do this, but for anybody who really wants to, you know, be on the cutting edge of what is going to be the next trend in miniature painting, look at scale modeling and, right. you know, you'll most find, most likely find the, the next thing. Um, we already it's, got it. It's sprue glue. That stuff's been around forever. And now like there's like 10 different YouTubers who do miniature painting that are all doing this brew glue stuff. And I'm like, I knew about that when 
when my brother was doing models when I, we were in high school, that was when something we were, they taught him how to do that. Yeah. yeah, when we were sniffing glue back way back in the day. Right, right. You know, with the tube of testers, and you're like, oh, melt that stuff up and put it in. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, uh, it's you know because I mean those those people who've been doing scale modeling for ages, yeah, like th- that's you know, and of course you know they're all often old cats and you know it's years and years of trying to be efficient because you know oftentimes a scale modeler yeah well obviously they're they're very concerned with scale and you know making things look realistic at that distance you know at arm's length right making something look like something we see miles away or even a few yards away but bringing it to that tiny little size you know it takes a lot of attention to detail and yeah. miniature painting is the same thing it's it's really miniature painting is the baby brother to scale uh scale modeling right and all the techniques and everything like that that make scale modeling really awesome um you know right translate and trickle down into miniature painting and i and i've posed this question to people before that what is in miniature painting that trickled upwards Mm -hmm. into scale modeling or into art and you know the main body of art and i'm i'm really hard to find an example of that Mm -hmm. of something that comes from from miniature painting that influenced larger the bigger brothers of it because miniature painting is the baby brother right well it's also one of the newer forms of it too so you know it's sure hard pressed for for it but i'm gonna i'm gonna do a full circle funny one for you with this because i'm a member of the national capital model soldier society and we had a meeting last month and there was an older gentleman who was talking about who'd been scale modeling for ages and he was talking about um, how he discovered how this thing called sprue glue. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, like, and like the whole conversation of like other scale modelers and the historical models going, oh, that's a cool idea. And I'm like, oh, this is huge in the war game. Like, this is just on that other side of the, the clock right now. It's huge in the war gaming. It'll be back in the, you know, it's a Gundam thing as well. A lot of people yeah. use it for Gundams. And so I'm like, it, it, this is just kind of the circle going round and round, you know, like yeah. rediscovering old technology, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it's really funny. But um, so uh, do you venture into, speaking of scale models, do you venture into uh, like uh, busts or larger scales at all? Yes. Well, um, I have done busts. Um, well, this is mostly an audio format. This is so. audio, so yeah. <laughs> they're going to take but, your word for it. You know? Yeah, they're going to take my word. Yeah, I have done busts. Uh, I have a few. That's only maybe in the last couple of years that I've gone into some larger scale. Although I have, in the last 10 years, had a wicked Forge World addiction uh, mm. to the larger scale um, miniatures. And like I have like a big Phantom Titan from Armor Cast, which is like 30 years old as well. And... Um, Currently, I'm working through a McFarlane action figure, and so I would consider that a larger scale figure because, you know, it is the scales change, right? It's more like a 112 scale than it is, um, you know, the miniature, of course, right? Um, And I've got a few of those. I've also got like the Bandai Marines, and you know, like I've I do all sorts of stuff. I've even repainted like a Funko. I don't. Would that be considered larger scale? I don't know, but oh, certainly, yeah, you know. Yeah, so um, I'm not hung up on just doing, you know, Warhammer 40,000 figures or Necromunda or, you know, mm-hmm. whatever, um, especially if, um, you know, the opportunity is that I'm going to uh, basically, you know, teach people what I'm doing and what techniques I'll employ and what materials and things of that nature and to make, a, you know, a lesson out of it. Um, yeah, I'm open to anything, um, you know. I'm I'm not too concerned about the sculpt itself, be it, you know, something very simple or very highly detailed and textured. And, you know, I'm not concerned about those kinds of things. It's just, you know, realistically, I, the only thing I'm concerned with is when people ask me, well, what do you want to see? What would, ha- what do you feel like would um, this subject would help you become better? And that's often how I approach all my videos is, how is this going to help somebody? How is somebody um, going to learn from this? And, you know, I, again, 
with a lot of my videos, I am repeating myself, but I've got to remember that sometimes this video might be the person's introduction into my work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I end up repeating myself, even though personally, I hate repeating myself. (laughs) <laughs> you know, but you know, I think it's it's a necessary evil because even when people continue to watch it's still uh, I don't know it's muscle memory it's yeah. you know like they're like the repetition of it is still part of the learning process you know yeah, yeah. especially for someone like me who I have to take notes for I have to write notes really for me to process something and so you know being able to repeat and do like that type of stuff is definitely an advantage for a learner like me so you may hate it but i appreciate when you're repetitive <laughs> <laughs> well now to sidetrack things up a little bit do you okay. are, are, do you find yourself being a visual thinker or an abstract thinker now you mentioned you write it down so mm-hmm. that to me would in, indicate that you are more of an abstract thinker so like if you were to read an instruction manual, it doesn't have to have pictures in it for you to understand what it, what it's conveying. Right. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. me, me personally, and I find this to be fairly common amongst artistic types is most of us are visual type thinkers mm-hmm. where you can show us without explaining and we can duplicate it. Right. right. That's a visual thinker is that we can see something, we can emulate it and without, you know, words even gotcha. being discussed right Mm -hmm. Uh, my father was the same way because he was a programmer and and very logical yeah he could read things and then when i whenever i describe something to him and i would show him he'd be like okay you got to tell me what you're doing there i don't understand what you're doing and you know what i mean like he i would have to explain these finer points to him versus you know i could just show somebody something and just not even tell them what i'm doing i'm just grabbing it you know what i mean and so with these video tutorials that I create, I try to, you know, find the medium, the middle ground on those two types of things. So I try to be accurate and consistent in my descriptions of things so that those who, you know, have to take, take a very logical step towards something they can follow along. And those who are, you know, I can just show them what to do. You know, I also try to accommodate for that as well. And, you know, video tutorials i think are a very good middle ground for that kind of thing as opposed to you know a book which Mm -hmm. you know can be but it leans more towards the the the, um the logical side of the brain right and you know and there uh, my solution that really kind of upped the value of youtube paintings for me was putting the closed captions on Mm. that actually solved a lot for i was like oh okay i can pause it and i can read it and i I didn't even think about it yeah you know, and so I get, it actually helps me a lot. I also get a, a kick out of watching some of the European painters translations that happen on the bottom, which are really, <laughs> yeah, and, yes. and it's really funny, you know, I got to yeah, watch Sometimes I, the accents kind of throw you off. It, it does. And then, but I, I got to watch the, um, Angel Geraldo's videos just to hear him say poco poco, um, you know, because <laughs> he says poco poco every video. <laughs> does he? Oh, you know it's, what? I, do, I don't watch any of his work. Everybody's got their own flavor and style to watch, yeah. you know, well, and, and, and and the thing is, is that um, all the all the YouTube creator, well, anybody who's creating in this day and age, um, and these you know, miniature painting videos and tutorials and just whatever's, you know, we're all talking about the same thing, right? Everybody, you like, if you're brand new to this, yeah, it's going to be all brand new information to you. If you're intermediate and advanced, yeah, everybody's talking about the same stuff. Uh, some people might use different terminologies, um, but otherwise, everybody's talking about the same thing. Um, but the personal journey that each of those artists took to get to that point is unique to that artist. And that is really what is of value when you tune in to artists and these creators and stuff like that. And so me personally, I mean, I'm really busy, so I don't, um, you know, I don't really spend too much time. I try not to anyway, um, you know, watching uh, any other creators, uh, because mainly because I don't want it to influence my own work, right. mm-hmm. you know, so, yep. And I've heard, I've heard of authors that don't read when they're writing a project. Cause they don't want to mm-hmm. incorporate stuff, you know, like if that they've read into their work, you know what I'm saying? So I get, yeah. I, I get that. And you know, that's, um, I don't, I, I am a massive podcast junkie, but when I'm in between editing and stuff like that, I, I get like, 
maybe one other podcast in during it, you know, in a, in a two week time period now. So, um, you know, I totally get the, that, yeah, that's, that doesn't, that doesn't surprise me to sit here and say, you don't watch much of it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and again, I like, I don't really watch a lot of TV. Mm -hmm. Um, when I'm working, I only listen to music. I don't listen to audiobooks or podcasts or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, because I find this too distracting. Uh, audiobooks or podcasts because well i mean if i'm tuning into a podcast i want to hear what the people are saying mm -hmm. and to properly listen to what somebody's saying well you have to pay attention and the idea of um multitaskers uh multitasking listening while i'm doing something else that's false um multitasking is a myth we can only do one thing at a time as human beings mm -hmm. and so when you are listening to an audiobook and following along with the story, um, unless you're paying 100% attention, you're going to miss things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yes, your brain can tune in back and forth. And, you know, it's kind of the rubbing your tummy and patting your head kind of thing. Sure. <laughs> but, you know, you can't solve complex equations while patting your head, rubbing your tummy, and, you know, stomping your foot to a beat. And, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you can't do that. It's, you know, our brains are not wired that way. We're just right. not evolved to that point that we can do that. We're not computers. And my brain, when I'm concentrating on painting, I like to 100% focus on what I'm doing. Music is more of a subconscious thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because I've heard a lot of stuff, you know, a million times beforehand, it more or less conjures up imagery in my brain and you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And but if I had an, uh, an audio book or a podcast running and they're talking about something interesting, mm -hmm. I would have to pay attention to it. And that's why when people say, well, I have, you know, I do these podcasts or, um, you know, audio books, it's more background. Mm -hmm. Well, then what's the point? If it's just background, if it's just background noise. It's just having the TV on for the sake of having TV on. Well, it's more of a distraction than it is um, something helpful, in, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, just because, yeah, you're going to catch something and go, oh, and it's going to pull you out of the moment. And you might have been onto something when you were working on your miniature or your painting or whatever. You might have been onto something and all of a sudden you, you caught a joke and you're, <laughs> and it takes you out of that moment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And as opposed to just being focused on your task and just bring it to completion and, you know. It's just about being focused, I guess. <laughs> right. No, no. And, you know, I, like, yeah, like you said, everybody's journey is unique and different. And, you know, and, and you're right. Often I listen to the same podcast that I listened to when I was painting later because I have no idea what was happening. I got right. so focused on painting and such along those lines. And so, no, I totally, I can totally see that. But do you want to be the first, uh, the first victim we've ever had of the lightning round? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and Throw so, it at but, me, man. And I, I was able to, to, to switch out questions. So the brush looking question, that's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I'm going to ask you a series of questions and I want you to give me kind of your first gut reaction uh, answer to them. Okay. Uh, long answer or short answers? Um, probably, you know, lightning round would probably, probably should do shorter answers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So no long winded Chris Bellow takes an hour to explain things. Got you. Uh, and unless we're onto something, you know, I'm not going to stop you. You know what I mean? I, I, I always say the guest rules in, in this joint. So, um, so, all right. So the first, first lightning round question is the gods of the paintbrush have descended and decided that you may only paint with one paintbrush for the rest of your life. What brush, what size? Uh, a sable number one. Sable um, number one. Nice. Yeah. Any sable brush. That's a number one size. Um, this is going to sound like a plug, but, uh, for the last couple of years, I've been using an artist opus number one, and that does everything for me, uh, right up to eyeballs. Nice. Okay. No, that you, you, everybody seems to get free advertising on this show. So we're not <laughs> worried about it. All right. Most annoying thing about miniature painting. Um, uh, most annoying thing. Oof, man, there's a few, um, <laughs> the, the paint on the thumb thing or fingernails or whatever, uh, that that's annoying. Uh, when people aren't taking care of the tools, that's annoying. Um, you know, painting straight from the pot, that's annoying. Um, you know, uh, man, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm starting to get angry just thinking about oh, all no. these things. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to the Chris Bellow Grievance Hour. This is the Chris Bellow Grievance Hour here on yeah. Listening to Paint Try. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, next one, TMM or NMM? 
and why? Um, TMM, uh, because um, the ambient light in a room is always changing. Uh, and when you are a you know good painter and you are also a gamer, the true metallics will look better on the tabletop as opposed to a non-metallic metal, uh, which is more geared towards display and uh, competition type painting. And it only works from a fixed angle as opposed to true metallics, which uh, rely on the ambient light in the room or even a camera or whatever. And um, yeah, it, it just looks better in those instances. In reality, true metallics looks better, whereas non-metallic metal only works from certain angles. Nice. All right. When was the last time you drank your paint water? Huh? It's been a while. Until um, then? <laughs> well, I, occasionally it does happen. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not perfect. Uh, but lately I have been playing with a lot of solvent-based paints. So mm -hmm. for me to drink my water, I probably poison myself. <laughs> That's a good thing to get out of the <laughs> habit of drinking your water. Yeah. All right. So um, heavy body ink or model paint? Heavy body ink or model paint? Oof. That's a tough one. Um, man, I would have to go with a heavy, heavier body ink <laughs> as opposed to a paint because an ink will be really, really saturated as inks are. And a heavier bodied, uh, I'm not even sure what a heavy bodied ink would be. Like, I, I mean, like, I guess paints like, because uh, I use a lot of golden high flow, and that would be more akin to a a heavier body ink because it's designed to go in markers, pens, uh, airbrush, and can also be brushed on, uh, which is, I'm a big fan of golden high flow paint. So that would be, would be about in that category, but I've used like Liquitex inks and those flow just like a regular type of ink um, and a model paint. Yeah. Because like miniature paint, it's, it's geared for miniatures. And, you know, it like Citadel side of things, it tends to be a heavier bodied, uh, you can always thin it, you know, and I mean, it's, yeah, I really don't have a preference per se, I guess, but I would have to go with the, uh, the, the heavier bodied ink. Sorry, I was trying to try to keep that to as short as possible. That's okay, you're fine. <laughs> and actually for our listeners out there, I'm, I see over Chris's right shoulder, uh, a large pile of golden flow inks or golden flow paints. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> I do have a few of them too. I actually like their shader paints that are they yeah. put out too. Those are really nice. Yeah. You just got to tame the gloss on them. Yeah. Oh yeah. But I mean, like you know, that yeah. it, it's it's easy enough to do. Um, yep. Oh yeah. You know. The the tools out there, like the what is it, the ultra matte varnish from AK Interactive, just yeah. knocks knocks them all out. Well, yeah. thank you for for being the willing victim of the lightning <laughs> round. I oh, is that it? That's oh. it. I just five. I'm I'm starting off in baby steps because this is oh, a okay. new segment. Gotcha. See how it goes. And uh, I was and getting ready to be grilled by the Inquisition here. No, 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 no. I don't. You know, it's one of those things. Uh, I I don't know. I just <laughs> I don't ask questions ever about the like. Because there, it, politics creeps in uh, miniature painting, personal views, and crap like that. Sure. I, I don't want to hear it. I want to hear about painting. You know what I mean? Like, I, the, I, I, this is a podcast about paint and toys, right? You know, like, and I want to keep it there. <laughs> yeah. No, and and that's the thing is that yeah, in this day and age, you know, it's you know, it's it is hard to avoid all those topics, and you know, this hobby, um, is like like all hobbies, it's supposed to bring you joy. And it shouldn't stress you out. And so, yeah, I mean, even for myself, uh, I am very politically minded. And, you know, I, it's hard to keep that kind of stuff out. And I even struggle to stay on topic a lot of times. Uh, <laughs> if you've ever, anybody who's ever turned into Way of the Brush, um, you know, yeah, it goes off the rails pretty darn fast around there. And, you know, it's hard. I mean, which is why I rely on, you know, the viewer to ask me legit questions about painting and stuff like that to stay on topic and which is why probably I focus mostly on helping people because you know it's honestly one of those rare uh things in this world that is truly good when we're trying to help others agreed you know like like when you're honestly trying to help somebody how can you view that in any way shape or form as a negative if you're honestly trying to help somebody, you know, even if it's just something small, you know, yeah, we're, we're painting toy soldiers. I'm struggling to apply a paint. How, you know, help me out. 
as opposed to, you know, somebody who needs a ride somewhere or, you know, is, you know, their health is failing. And, you know, I mean, like these kind of things is much deeper, but again, it's kind of baby steps, right? I mean, it starts with, you know, these little things and it develops into bigger things. And, you know, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Positive. Exactly. And, you know, and if there's anything that we can do to Dan and I try to do to help build community, that's our whole, that's our whole goal, right? Introduce people to artists they may not know, uh, Mm -hmm. get to know artists that they already know, like get more, you know, I'm saying get more in depth into the artists, pick their brain. That's, that's what we're all about, you know, and, you know, plus, like I said before, it's just a cheap ploy for me to meet cool people. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) It's a nice excuse. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. So um, as we kind of wind down, there's two kind of questions that I always like to ask of artists. Um, The first one is, are there miniatures out there for uh, anything that you would like to see painted, uh, made? Uh, Typically, I either say the Dark Tower characters from Stephen King's Dark Tower series. I'd love to see them in miniature form. But then my, my heart just exploded the other day when I saw the other one, which is Quicksilver from the Silverhawks TV show. Somebody actually made an STL of him and I, my neighbor printed him for me. And so I'm like in, uh, in hog's heaven. But um, long-winded question, but are there miniatures that you would like to see made that haven't been made yet? Um, I Honestly, I, there's nothing out there that I'm just dreaming that I would love to see. There are a lot of things that I would love to acquire. Mm-hmm. um mainly like for example from macross um there's one 120 scale garok um valkyries that you know in the jet form and in the, the what used to be called moth mode where it was the legs out and arms out and everything like that and they don't have the full you know 120 robot. scale but the full robot one mm-hmm. uh, that is one but i mean that kit costs like 700 bucks so <laughs> it's going to be a bit and it, that was a hard sell to try to explain to the wife you know because right yeah yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> honey but please it's a business expense honey please please <laughs> but um you know there's so many kits out there that i want um you know I, there's nothing really i mean you know sky's the limit really but there's a project that I've, I've wanted to tackle for a while which is a han solo and carbonite i want a one-to-one scale of that um one to one scale wow <laughs> yeah, yeah i want a one to one scale of, of han solo and carbonite i want that and i've you know i've perused the interwebs for those and you know it's it's going to be a couple bucks but <laughs> I, I think i'm going to probably pull the trigger on that i'll probably document that process um, I, hope, I hope so i'll be watching yeah sure. um but again yeah there's, there's there's just so many i mean like for everything from gun to 40k um, these Bandai Marines, when they announced that these Bandai Marines were coming out, well, I immediately bought the, uh, the first one and I got the Imperial Fist that came out. I didn't bother with the Salamander. I didn't care for the design of the gun. That was the only thing. This latest White Scar release for it, I, I didn't care for because I didn't notice mm-hmm. anything different about it. It was just like the first guy, except he's got a different, you know, he's, he's molded in different plastic. Big right. freaking whoop. Um, you know, the McFarlane uh, figures, I've really been enjoying. I just recently acquired oh, the, um, the Intercessor with the Plasma. Uh, I'm currently working on the sister of battle. I also have a Necron and, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And of course now there's the, um, the, uh, what are the guys with the claws called for the Necrons? They got the claws. Destroyers or I don't know. I, played, I don't played ones. Played, played ones. ones. Okay. Yeah. They're, yeah. Called, they, they're basically got like skin dangling from them and everything Oof. really kind of horror Freddy Krueger type things. Right. Yikes. But anyway, um, you know, I'm excited for all those. Like, man, I'm just, I'm painting. And oftentimes, you know, it is the little kid in me that, you know, yeah, I want this. I want that. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, I have like a big pile of shame of, you know, Games Workshop kits. I've got a bunch of Bandai Star Wars stuff. I've got like all the 172 scale uh, ships that I, I'm a big pile of them that I still have to work on. I've got Gundams on the go. I've got World War II kit I'm supposed to be working on. You know what I mean? Like I've got all sorts of projects. I, I'm, oh, I've, I've got a Necromunda piece that I do. <laughs> a uh, piece of terrain, mm-hmm. um, you know, oh, man, it's just so many projects, so little time. What I need uh, are minions. I need a min, I mean minions <laughs> so that I can order them around. Nice. Uh, there used to be this old video game. Uh, it came out uh, late nineties, uh, Dungeon Keeper. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever played it. It was basically, you know, uh, it was a 2D graphic game. It was ISO, um, it was ISO metric view or whatever, ISO mm-hmm. view but you know what I mean? Um, 
and basically I used to love it because, you know, it was, you tell the little minions to clear this spot because we're going to build this kind of room. This, you know, it's like all about creating a dungeon. Um, but to make the workers go faster, you could smack them and your animation of your hand would be to, you know, backhander to the nice. little <laughs> But if you, if you hit them too many times, they died. <laughs> oh no. So, but the, the harder and faster you smack them, the faster they work. The faster and, they work. You know, so yeah, I need these little minions. I need these little imps in my workshop so that I can complete all my goals. <laughs> nice, nice. Oh, is it in Egyptian lore? There's shabti. You know, you need those little clay shabtis so you can go run out and do a bunch of different things for sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, the typically the kind of the question that we end on is um, the motto of our podcast is better, braver, and happier painters. And is there any advice that you could give to our listeners as they continue their journeys? Do not be afraid to fail. Enjoy your failures. Love your failures. Because each of your failures is an opportunity to learn. And as long as you're learning, you're improving. Thank you so much. Right, Chris, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to be here. Um, oh, this was a lot of fun. The YouTube channel is The Way of the Brush. And we'll put all of the watch all your links in the show notes and make sure that we reiterate them in the outro. So cool. thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Dan and I would like to thank Chris Bellow from The Way of the Brush for joining us today. We really appreciated him taking his time to share his painting journey and tips and advice with us. You can follow Chris at Way of the Brush on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, as well as Twitter, all at The Way of the Brush. He also runs a Patreon, so please feel free to check that out, as well as his website, which is www.thewayofthebrush.com. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Listening to Paint Dry, as well as on Twitter at Dry Painting. Drop us an email at listeningtopaintdry at gmail.com. If you want to talk to us about a project you're working on, thoughts on the show, let us know what's going on. We'd love to hear from you. Please also like, subscribe, or follow wherever you get your podcasts. We are on over 150 platforms, and if you by chance go there, please leave us a positive review. That would help the podcast out a great deal. We'll be back again uh, in two weeks with an interview with Craft World Studios. I'm very excited as we continue our international art party with the trip to Serbia. We're also finishing up our next genre focus, which will be on Greek mythology. And during that time, we'll get back to some of our normal segments, like what we're working on. And we have another e listener email, which we're really excited to share with people. Uh, actually, it's a chat on Instagram, but hey, whatever. Five listeners, we're getting there. Remember to relish your failures and to learn from them to become a better, braver, happier painter. Until next time. Listening to Paint Dry with Mike and Dan is a production of LTPTWMD. All rights reserved. No portion of this recording may be used without the express written consent of the host. The music is Death by a Thousand Questions by Springtide. Download from the free music archive on a non-commercial attribution share alike basis. All views and opinions expressed in the show are solely the views and opinions of the person who said them. All celebrity voices, if any, were impersonated and done so poorly.